Hi, I'm Kira, an independent animator and filmmaker. In this video, I'll tell you how I produced my most recent film, To Cross the Sunset. Depending on how you look at it, this film has been years in the making and has undergone many changes and overhauls. It was a long journey, and I'm excited to give you a glimpse of what it took to bring you my favorite film that I've made so far. So, way, way back in the day, one of my hobbies was constructing languages, or conlanging for short. If that sentence made no sense to you, think of fake languages like Quenya or Sindarin from Lord of the Rings, Valyrian and Dothraki from Game of Thrones, or Klingon from Star Trek. Now, I'm not saying I was at the level of all these well-known and well-developed conlangs, but I had a good time making up grammar and vocabulary. Yes, I was and I still am a nerd. If you're wondering what this has to do with To Cross the Sunset, well, the project that would later inspire the film started out as a simple conlang experiment. I started out putting together some sounds I thought were interesting, and before I knew it, I had a pretty robust grammar and vocabulary of over 300 words and some example texts for a language I named aleti, stemming from the, the verb aletet, to speak. It didn't take long for me to start imagining who the speakers of this made-up language could be. Initially, I imagined a world where there was this magical force called Las Aywa, the ancient word for the water, that possessed people. And then there was this whole messy plot stemming from there. This was developed during my early days as a storyteller, and I didn't know how or what to focus on when developing an idea. This world and its story quickly expanded over the years, and the cast got too big for me to keep track of, and the story just didn't make sense. Ultimately, I decided to kill my darlings, as writers say, and focus on La Sote's family. Maybe I'll revisit the world and the other characters some other day? Because there's definitely some cool ideas in there. But in the end, they took away from the story that, deep down, I really wanted to tell. The decision to simplify didn't solve all of my problems at once. There was still many iterations of the story. I kept whittling away, sculpting, refining, but I was really struggling to find the heart of the story. A major breakthrough came after I stumbled across the Crash Course mythology video about dying god myths. Of course, the nerd in me enjoyed learning about this type of mythology, but the video also gave me a better understanding of the mythological tone and message I wanted to play with. Envisioning La Sorte as a kind of deity whose death instigated cosmological change set me on the right path. That model was not only something that many of the myths described in the video shared, but also feels a lot like the way I came to understand my grandmother's passing at a young age while watching my parents grieve. Once I found that emotional core, the story had a direction, and I knew I had to make the film. Not saying it was easy after that, though. After many failed scripts, writing the story just wasn't working, and I was starting to doubt myself. I would write a script, start working on the next steps, and realize the story was just not right. I made multiple attempts to illustrate beatboards for the film, only to realize that the story didn't work. It wasn't until I gave up on writing that I had another breakthrough. After maybe the millionth failed draft of the script, I decided to try something different. Though the words weren't flowing, I always had vivid images in my mind that I was trying to stitch into a coherent story via script. I decided to cut out the middleman and draw what I saw in my mind, then order the images into a chronological story. This worked especially well. I think it may be my go-to approach from now on. Throughout the entire writing process, I was also trying to find the right visual style for the film. 
To capture the right vibe for the environment, I needed something that would be realistic for a solo artist to execute in an animated film while still looking amazing. It took me a while and a lot of failed experiments, but I am very happy with the look I ended up with. If you're interested in more details about that process, I have another more in-depth video about it linked in the description. In contrast, the character designs in this film pretty much stayed the same since the first iterations, way back from early imaginings of the world. I did oscillate between going for what I called the titty outlook, or a more modest covering outfit for the female characters, and how I wanted the characters to style their hair. All my attempts to design upper body garments with materials I imagined the characters would have seemed to bring more attention to the area, so I scrapped those ideas at the end. At one point, I had imagined the Kenme as being more uptight, so I thought an updo would suit her. But as the story and her character evolved, that became less and less true. All in all, I'm pretty happy with how the characters ended up looking. At the time, Fear Rules This Forest had just premiered on YouTube, and I hadn't sold enough scenes or postcards to pay for voice actors. Without knowing if I'd ever earn enough money to do so, I decided I would have to do the voice acting myself, and save what I could in hope I would have enough to pay for a composer later. I'm not much of an actor, but I did my best. It was hard to get all the characters to sound different. In one case, I resorted to using a filter in GarageBand to get my voice to sound deeper. Maybe not the most refined approach, but it did the job. I'm just glad I was able to find a way to get this story told despite the limitations. Something I did differently with this film compared to my last few is that I mostly worked out the timing of the film visually. For past projects, I would take the dialogue recordings and time them out by ear. Then, I would base the timing of the animation off of that. While that worked, I found this approach had a tendency to give a film an unintended, rushed feeling. I wanted an approach that gave me more control, especially for To Cross the Sunset, which demanded a more subdued pace. This time, I timed out the animatic without sound, then added the dialogue later. I did have to go between my animation app and iMovie a couple of times to get it right, but it was definitely worth it. After getting the timing down, it was time to finish the backgrounds and refine the character movement. I have a few videos of me showing that process in real time if you'd like to see how I actually did that. Normally, I would have reached out to a composer once I had the animatic done, so we could have the music and the animation finished around the same time but I didn't have the funds until I had just finished the animation. So while Paulina, the very talented musician who made the music you're listening to now, and all of the music for my film so far, was working on the score, I took the time to design these prints and this sticker, available now for a limited time on my store. <laughs> Once Paulina finished the score, the last step was to add it to the film, along with sound effects. Many of the sounds in the film I recorded myself, getting creative with things in my room that kind of sounded like what I was going for. Then I mixed it all together to the best of my ability in iMovie. In the future, I would definitely like to hire a sound engineer to create and mix the sound for me, as I am aware it is far from one of my strengths. I just didn't have the funds to even think about that this time around. Jordan Sadler asks, I'm so interested in how you choose your colors. Everything is so vibrant yet doesn't clash, especially when choosing colors for shadows and highlights. First, Jordan, I gotta thank you. You have been such a supportive friend and have been encouraging me even before I started animating. Thank you for believing in me. But back to your excellent question. 
The answer to your question comes back to color theory, which is a bunch of rules and guidelines about which colors vibe together and how to create good contrast. There are tons of resources that can explain that better than I could, but I can definitely tell you about the approach I used for To Cross the Sunset. I started by choosing three colors in different color families, I'm not sure if that is the right word, that had the right vibe, and then tweaked them to create a collection of color palettes for different sections of the film. Then, for each scene, I referenced these palettes to create the specific color scheme by adjusting the saturation and value. I don't add highlights or shadows very often, but when I do, I usually just make the base color slightly darker or lighter as needed. Basically, like a lot of creative processes, I approach the colors by gradually limiting my choices, then finally committing to the results. This worked really well this time around, so I'll likely be using it again. I am very proud of To Cross the Sunset. Normally, by the time I finish a project, I absolutely hate it. I have seen it inside and out, frame by frame, for hours, for months. All I see are the mistakes. But looking at this film, I feel that it is the most emotionally honest story I've told yet. I see that my storytelling and animation skills have improved massively since my last film, and I finished a project that I've been working on for years. That's an accomplishment even I struggle not to feel a little good about. Of course, there are areas I hope to improve in my next film. In terms of art, it would be a challenge, but potentially worth it, to play around with lighting. That adds a lot of hours of work, hours that I really don't have, but I'm sure it could look great. I also would like to have better sound and better acting in my next film. Both of those are things I don't think I have any business doing myself. I can admit my weaknesses but for me to delegate those things requires a budget. If you'd like to help me afford a composer, voice actors, or even hire a sound engineer, all the things that would help me make better films, there are two things that you can do that would help me immensely. One, you could go to the link in the description and buy the limited edition merchandise. For To Cross the Sunset, I'm selling two prints and a sticker. Look at how cool these are. And then the second thing is that you can follow the other link to sign up for a monthly pledge to my Patreon. The kind folks over there have already helped me afford the mic I'm using to record right now and upgrade my animation software that I'm using for my next film. In addition to helping me, you would get access to behind the scenes content. All my patrons were able to watch me make this film in real time. Sign up now to see what I'm working on for my next film or see some of the extra art from To Cross the Sunset that didn't make it into this video. If you're not interested or able to support me monetarily, I would still greatly appreciate it if you would subscribe to my channel so you can see more films when I upload, or follow me on my other social media. I hope you enjoyed this reflection on how I made To Cross the Sunset. Thank you for watching.